Let's go to God in prayer and let us pray. Dear God, open our hearts to receive your word, not just our ears, but our hearts. Keep us alert. Even if we had a tired night last night, may we be able to focus on your word and may your word truly be in our lives a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want for us to reflect on the gospel as was written in Mark chapter 3. The entire chapter, but I will begin with verse 20 because I believe this is a pivotal verse in our being able to understand what is happening in the entire chapter. The before and the, the after. So I'm highlighting which verse again, sorry? Verse 20. And the crowd, we could read it together. And the crowd came together again so that Jesus and his disciples could not even eat. Oh, let me see, let, let me see how I could help you to follow both what is going on here and in this chapter. You see, this verse is key because it provides us with a platform for Jesus to address the matter of unclean spirits. This verse is key because it provided Jesus with a platform and the text, the passage. It is a key verse that leads into Jesus addressing the matter of unclean spirits. So what was the problem at hand? The problem was Jesus and his disciples were not eating. Now how could that be a problem? <laughs> of course there are all kinds of other dimensions to this but I, I want us to look at the text in its text. <laughs> and context. So Jesus and his disciples, they're not eating. And they're trying to understand why aren't they eating? Why aren't they eating? Now, there's several ways we can go at this. But I'm not sure. We could conclude that, bring back up the text there, verse 20, and if you follow what is going on before, we could conclude, reasonably so, that the crowd, and when you read the other verses, that, you know, there were so many persons to be healed and delivered, you could read it to say that the crowd and the demands and was so great, Jesus was on high gear, in high gear, responding to the needs of the people that he could not find time to eat. Now that's one logical way you could approach it, that he was so overwhelmed as it were meaning there's so many persons that came for Jesus to respond to their needs that he could not eat wow because it says the crowds came so many people surrounded Jesus and in fact it says that Jesus saw how many persons were there 
and was responding to both physical and spiritual need. That's one way of it. But another way of looking at it is not simply that Jesus was so crowded by the needs that he couldn't eat, but that their not eating was deliberate. Maybe something similar to Matthew chapter 4. Remember where Jesus went into the wilderness and he fasted as he prepared for ministry. So it could be that, that this was a deliberate experience of fasting. But whatever is the reason, it created some questions in people's minds. Why are they not eating? Are you following that? That was verse 20. And his family and others came up with what one may call a human, physical, natural explanation. So the people's assessment as to why Jesus wouldn't eat is what? Something is mentally wrong with him. The man can't be right in his mind. So for them, they came up with something of a, a physical, human, natural explanation. That he is out of his mind. How could you not eat? And the family seems to have bought into it. I could only conclude so. Because it says, when the family heard it, they went out to restrain him. You only go restrain the man if you think something wrong. Because the people were saying, in a right in the head. <laughs> but the scribes, the scribes were, you know, and they presented themselves on several occasions as the authority in religion and things spiritual. So while the people said there is a physical explanation for it, the Pharisee says there is a spiritual explanation. Are you with me, the scribes? So what do the scribes say? The scribes say that he is the devil's servant, the devil manifested, He's Satan, Beelzebub, demonic, prince of demons. That's why he's able to do this. That he is a part of the realm of the wicked. Satan's servant and angels. That's where he gets this ability from and this power to do all that he's doing. They go on. Not just that he's not eating because of some demonic power, but that's why he's able to do what? Cast out demons. Go back to that. You see that? He says, the scribes came and they said he is Beelzebub, which is really saying he's spiritually evil, Satan. And by the ruler of demons, Satan, he is doing what? Casting out demons. So let's follow what's going on here. So the problem, the introductory issue is what? What's the issue at hand? Jesus and his disciples not eating. Explanation one, physical. What is that explanation? Mentally ill, he's out of his mind, mental illness. Explanation two, by the scribes, is that this is spiritual problem. And the problem is that he is working for Satan by the rule of this world. That's why he is able to do what he does. Hmm. So the scribes were actually claiming that Jesus had an unclean spirit, a demonic spirit. And, and that's why, that's why, if we jump down to the end of that, well, near the end of that chapter, near the end of that chapter, verse 28, 
29, but mainly 30. Look at what it says in 30. For they said he has an... So imagine, they're accusing Jesus of being demonic. They're accusing Jesus of being evil and demonic. And they're saying, that which is in him, enabling to do what he does, causing him, motivating, empowering him to do what he does is evil, satanic, and wicked. And you heard who said so, right? Who said so? The scribes, his religious authority. So, that's why later on Jesus said they were blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. Because they're saying, how could you call the Spirit at work in me demonic and evil? What craziness is this with these people? So Jesus responds, Jesus responds by clarifying the matter. So remember, he's not eating. Some say it's a mental illness. The scribes say, no worries, because he's demonic and that's why he's even able to cast out demons. You all were wondering why he had power over demons? Because he's working for Satan. So Jesus responds. Jesus says, well, implied, you got it right, you know. The matter is not purely physical, but what you are seeing is correct. It is spiritual. Come on, talk to me. You hearing me? He says, but your analysis is flawed. He says, yes, the matter is spiritual. But this is not a demonic, ungodly, satanic spirit in me. But this is what? The Holy Spirit of God working in me. So I'm not working for Satan. I'm working against Satan. And by extension, of course, for the kingdom of God. Are you, are you following that? That's why Jesus goes on and he says, come on, what you're saying don't make sense. A kingdom divided against itself wouldn't stand. A house divided against itself can't stand. Verse 26, 26 goes on. He says, look, if Satan is fighting, in other words, if Satan is fighting against himself and is divided, then he cannot and his so let's apply that to what Jesus is saying. So if you're saying I am Satan and I am casting out demons which is satanic, then it is that Satan has risen up against Satan. Which means that Satan's kingdom is divided, which means that I am actually bringing an end to Satan's reign. So even so, you know, make sense. Are you following me? So he's saying, look at it. Because of the work I am doing, you say it's Satan in me. If you even take your logical explanation, Jesus said, don't make sense because still it means that I am working to destroy Satan. Hmm. And that's why he goes on to say in verse 27, he says, you can't go into a man's house and defeat the man without tying him up. In other words, I could only be able to do what I'm doing if I have exercised some authority and power over Satan. Uh, are you with me here? <coughs> So Jesus is saying here that his ministry and what he has been doing is in opposition and in conflict with 
Satan. Let me say it again. Jesus is saying his ministry is in opposition to and in conflict with Satan. Hmm. So Jesus is saying, I'm not working with Satan or for Satan. I am working against Satan. <coughs> so he said, look, this is basically what he's saying, you know. It's like he's asking them rhetorical questions in this. Are people being delivered? You all tell me. Hmm? That's what he's saying. Are people rejecting Satan's authority in their life? Are people turning away from sin as a result of my ministry? So let, let's, let's, let's be the crowd. Let's be the crowd as if Jesus were to ask. Are people being delivered from demonic influence in their lives? What the crowd says? Are people being delivered from the power of Satan in their lives? Are people rejecting sin and overcoming sin in their lives? You all are a real lukewarm crowd, boy. I expected some strong yesterday. So Jesus says, okay then. So if my work, my ministry is undermining the kingdom of Satan, then... I can't be Satan. Hello, are you with me? <laughs> I tell you all that's why children must be in church. And you've heard me say it before, I am convinced that these are not coincidences. They happen too often. The timing is impeccable. <laughs> so anyway, Thank you, little child. You hear? I said just now you all were lukewarm and the child demonstrated how strong the answer should have been. So, so let's take this a little further. This debate is relevant because <laughs> the truth is no one sees the spirit that is at work in you. Tell me if you heard that. Let me say it again, I'll clarify. I'll, I know you're thinking, okay, I'll add another piece, but let me say it again. No one with their eyes sees the spirit that is at work in you. Am I correct? Can you see in the physical, natural, with your eyes, the spirit? Can you watch your neighbor and see which spirit inside them? Hello? Come talk to me, talk to me. I want to make sure you're following me with this. So you can't see what spirit is in them and functioning in them. And that's why the scribes can accuse Jesus of having an unclean spirit. And of course, because they were considered religious authority, they know the Bible. If they say so, some people would say, it got to be, it got to be so. Because you see, the spirit is an invisible presence and the influence in our lives that is made visible through physical, visible things. It is made known to us in our thoughts, because the kind of spirit at work in us will manifest itself in how we think. It is made visible in our attitudes. Did somebody say amen? The kind of spirit at work in us will be manifested in our attitude. It will be made manifested in our actions. Hello, are you with me? That's why you've heard me say this before. That's why, if you remember Jesus' baptism, when God was saying to the crowd that my spirit is in him, what did God do? What did God do? Send a, a dove 
the Holy Spirit wasn't the dove. Are you with me? But the physical evidence of this dove landing on Jesus said to the crowd in the physical natural world that something spiritual was going on that Jesus had the Spirit of God in him. <laughs> Tell me with me there. You following so far? And this is where some problems exist. Because you cannot see the Spirit in somebody, we can only see when that is manifested. <laughs> That's why some people over the years try to manufacture the manifestation. Tell me you get that. It's not new. Don't think it's a current church problem. Over the years, that's why some people try to what? Manufacture the manifestation. If you remember in 1 Corinthians, that was one of the early problems the church had. Anybody with me here? That's why Paul wrote that you could speak in tongues, you could prophesy, you could have all these gifts of the Spirit, quote unquote, but you do not have love, he says. Then he says it means that the Spirit of God is not truly at work. Come on, talk to me. Because in the, in the Corinthian church, what people are trying to do is to advertise, to manufacture the evidence. So they thought that so long as I start rattling off some tongues, that would be outward evidence for people to say what? Oh, he has the spirit in him. Hello? Anybody hearing me? That's why people were doing all these dramatic things because it was their way of trying to give you the impression that the Spirit was in you. That's why Paul spoke so strongly about these misuse of spiritual gifts. And that's why he chided them because effectively Paul says, look, these gifts are not for yourself and for building up yourself and for self-promotion. In other words, if God's spirit is at work in you, your motivation will not be self-promotion. That's why, for example, in the same tongues and so Paul says, well, if you're speaking in tongues and nobody can be built up by it, then you're only trying to big up yourself. Hello, you remember? And that's why even today we see people trying to manufacture the manifestation. And I always say be careful because what you see somebody do physically doesn't automatically mean the spirit is at work in them. And so sometimes they're, they're legitimate stories of the Spirit working. But there are also so many illegitimate stories where people are trying to make you think the Spirit is in them. And they start to shake and they, they, they whoa. Hey, hey. And, and when we see, and then they may say and do certain things. And, and, they, and when you see certain things, you say, oh, the Spirit is at work. Well, maybe you have to ask, which spirit? Hello, are you with me? And we are still today being easily misled by when we see somebody show certain physical signs that that of itself means the spirit is in them. And more and more people who try to demonstrate that the Spirit is in them, 
put on some postures and positions and, and you see they take on an almost kind of holy posture and, and, and they, they, you know, and they, and they, they try their best and some of them, you know, they, 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 they stink up the face and they close their eye in a way that mm, the spirit is moving in me. So let me clarify what I'm saying. I'm not saying that the spirit may not be moving in persons in that way. But I'm saying do not assume because you see that, that that is the spirit of God in them. That's why in Matthew chapter 7 as well, where Jesus said, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom. He goes on to say, on that day, many will say, haven't we cast out demons in your name? Haven't we prophesied in your name? Haven't we done many deeds of power in your name? And then I will say, depart from me. I never knew you. You see, not because people say the things that sound good mean that it is the Holy Spirit of God in them. Lord, Lord, are you with me? Lord, Lord, we'll come back to that. They know the right words to say. In other words, simply because you can talk good Christian language doesn't mean that it is God's spirit at work in your life. Say amen for that now. Matthew 7, cast out demons, did many deeds of power. Not because you do miracles and not because you do many things in the work of the Lord and the church mean the Spirit of God is at work in you. You could be the hardest church worker, the most faithful church worker. And that does not say it's the Spirit of God working in you. You hear the passage? They said, didn't we do many deeds of power in your name? <laughs> and Jesus would say in the next verse, I never knew you go away from me. You what? Wait, wait, wait. Let me go back to the verse before. This doesn't look right. This is what Jesus, these are who Jesus are calling evildoers. People who said, what? Lord, Lord. So they had good church language. Are you with me? You know you got French, English, Dutch, and church language. So they had good church language. It's the kind of people almost everything come out sound very spiritual. Then it says what? Didn't we prophesy? So, you know, whether it is speaking into people's lives, you know, anticipating future things or whatever it is, they did that. Didn't we cast out demons? You know, brought enabled deliverance in your name. And didn't we do many deeds of power? Come on, read that. That song like wicked people. <laughs> But look at the next verse. These people who said, Lord, Lord, who prophesied, cast out demons, and did many deeds of power in using God's name, Jesus says, I never knew you, you evil doers. Which means, he's saying, the spirit that was at work when you were doing all this good work, was not the Spirit of God. Anybody hearing that? But instead, if you're evil doers, it means it, this is who the Pharisees and scribes should have said is Beelzebul. Hello, are you with me? Jesus said they were evil doers. <laughs> wow. Imagine doing all that nice, good church stuff and still be called an evildoer. Hello? Hello? Hmm. Hmm. Are you with me? Wow. 
And why Jesus calls them evildoer, it connects us back with Mark, where the spirit at work in them, enabling them to do, wasn't the spirit of God. Hmm. Are you with me here? Wow. You see why? Because look at what Jesus says in this passage there. Depart from me, I never what? <laughs> it is one thing to know the name of the Lord. One thing to know the Lord. In fact, when we read down further, when Jesus meets demonic people, um, Jesus says, not further, earlier, oh, sorry, when Jesus meets some demonic, the demonic shout out, We, you are the Son of God. And Jesus forbid them from speaking. Are you with me here? He forbids them from speaking. Even though they knew who Jesus was. Whoa. Whoa. Are you getting that? You sure you get that? That is in verse 10 and 11. Sorry, verse 11. Whenever the unclean spirits, you hear what spirits they were? What spirits were they? Unclean, ungodly spirits. Whenever they saw Jesus, verse 11 in Mark 3, it says, they fell down before him and they shouted, you are the, son. the new Jesus. Whoa. Mark, Matthew 7, we just read. They knew the name of Jesus. So now because you know Jesus, means Jesus know you. Hello. And a relationship is not just who you know, but it's who know you too. So Jesus in Matthew says, they were doing all these great things. They knew who I was, but we had no relationship. Come on, there are a lot of people who are doing great church work in the name of the Lord, but have no. Come on, let me take that again. There are a lot of people who are working hard in the church, doing good things in the church, but have no. They know the name of Jesus. They know he's the son of God. They know he came to save, but he has not saved them. The number of persons who are working in the life of the church and in our world, calling on the name of God, but don't truly have a relationship with God. That's why Jesus could say, depart from me. I don't know you. According to Matthew, if you're doing great church work and God ain't send you, then it means the spirit working in you and through you is not the spirit of God. It's an unclean spirit. Mm. Are you following? <laughs> ay, ay, ay. So the Holy Spirit at work in us enables our salvation, our relationship with Jesus Christ. You got that? If God's Spirit is working in your life, then you will be saved. Let me say that again. If God's Spirit is in control and working in your life, you will be saved. Let me say it one more time. If God's spirit is in control and working in your life, then it wouldn't just be that you know the Bible stories about God. Then it wouldn't just be that you know that God is a powerful God. Then it wouldn't just be that you know that God is a miracle working God. But you will know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Do you know Jesus? And does Jesus know you? I don't talk about knowing as God, knowing every human being in his omnipotence and omniscience. But this is a knowing that is intimate, 
personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So let's take this a little further. Let's take this a little further. When the Holy Spirit is at work in our lives, it enables our salvation. It guides our service. It directs our growth. It ensures that we are able to satisfy, as reflected in God's word, what will make us ready for judgment. When the Holy Spirit of God is at work, it enables our salvation. It guides our service to God. It directs our spiritual growth. It enables us to be able to stand before God at judgment. Is what spirit, sorry, is the question you have to ask. We all have to ask. What spirit is at work in your life? What spirit is at work in your life? So here in this chapter, Jesus makes the point that the work of the Holy Spirit advances the kingdom of God and undermines the kingdom of Satan. Am I, am I on point there? In this Mark chapter 3, Jesus is making a simple point. When the Holy Spirit is at work in our lives, it advances the kingdom of God. When the spirit of Satan, unclean spirit, the ruler of this world, when he is working in your life, you advance Satan's agenda. When God is working in your life, the kingdom of God is advanced. So, do we see the advancement of the kingdom of God in our society, in our church, in our nation? Do we see a significant advancement of the kingdom of God? And if, and if we can say we are seeing the kingdom of God grow, then it means that the Spirit of God is, is at work in our lives. Let me say that again. If we are saying that the kingdom of God is growing, then it means we are saying that the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, is at work. That's why Paul was trying to say to us, the Holy Spirit isn't at work purely by people speaking in tongues and manifesting spiritual stuff. The Holy Spirit is at work when we see people being delivered, surrendering their lives to Jesus Christ. When we see the kingdom of God increasing, growing, advancing. If the kingdom of God is not advancing and growing, then it means the spirit of God is not at work as it ought to be. <laughs> Let me um, raise it differently. If what we see is more people in church and out of church choosing the life of sin, following the rule of this world, then the kingdom of Satan is growing. It means that there's a pervasiveness of unclean spirits. Because when the spirit of God is working, it convicts us of sin and it enables us to overcome sin. And it enables salvation. Did somebody say amen? And if in our lives, both personal and collective, we are not seeing an overcoming and a rejection of sin, if in our lives we are not hearing people being saved, surrendering their lives to Jesus Christ, then the spirit that is working can be the Holy Spirit. 
If on the other hand, people are more comfortable with sin, that people are more annoyed at righteousness, that people are agitated by what is good and upright and godly, whether in the church or out of the church, if people are more willing to have a lukewarm relationship with God, compromised faith, then whatever spirit is enabling that certainly is not the spirit of God. And Jesus said it's a what? So let me ask, what spirit is at work in you? How do you feel about sin and salvation? Has you, have you allowed God to take charge of your life? Do you have a disquiet and discomfort and a repulsion towards sin and wrong? What spirit is at work in you? <laughs> mm. Just before I continue. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not. Cast me not away from your presence, O oh Lord, and take Holy Spirit from me. Many of you may be aware that Psalm 51 was when David was confessing after what? After his affair with Bathsheba and having a husband killed. And David realized that the wrong spirit, an unclean spirit was in him. Are you hearing me now? That that lustful spirit was not a spirit of God. That spirit that caused him to kill and destroy a man was an unclean spirit. And David says, create in me a clean heart and put a right spirit within me. Because he realized with the wrong spirit, God will have to cast him away. He can't stand in judgment. Cast me not away from your presence, O Lord, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore. Restore to me what? Because if the Spirit of God is at work in our lives, we will be able to say, I'm saved, and I... So let me ask the question again. You see, this stuff, we don't like it. But it's important that we ask ourselves the question, what spirit is at work in you? And I'm making the point, I don't want you to miss it, because Jesus is clear here. Not because you're doing good things mean it's the Spirit of God at work. When the Spirit of God is working in your life, you get upset, turn away from, reject sin. What is interesting in this passage is the hypocrisy, <laughs> the contradiction. What the scribes are accusing Jesus of is really what they're guilty of. You realize that? The scribes were saying that Jesus had an unclean spirit. <laughs> but who really had the unclean spirit? <laughs> These religious fellows, the scribes. And those scribes were people who were really deep students of the law. And these scribes are the ones that actually had 
an unclean spirit. Look at verse 5. They bring up verse 5 for us. Look at verse 5. Jesus is angry. Look at verse 5. Let's read it together. He looked around at them with. He was grieved. Why? He was grieved at their stubbornness. Because if the Spirit of God was taking charge, they wouldn't be hard hearted. They will be open and responsive to the work and the word of God. Did somebody say amen for that? But they're hard hearted. They're so focused on their traditions and habits and practices and self promotion. Jesus said their hearts were so hard that their hearts were not being penetrated by God's spirit and his word. That's why in 29 he says there they will meet eternal damnation because they're blaspheming against the spirit. There's another study. So the passage begins with a problem. Doesn't label the problem. Unclean spirit. That's what the problem is in verse 5 earlier. And it ends virtually saying this is the problem. Unclean spirit. Unclean spirit. Unclean spirit. Unclean spirit. Hmm. Hmm. Unclean spirit. Spirit subjected to Satan, the ruler of this world. It doesn't advance the kingdom of God, but it works against it. If by our lives and our living and our speaking we are working against the kingdom of God you have an unclean evil spirit in you now we don't like this stuff but certainly it's not the Holy Spirit if by the way you and I are living we are undermining the kingdom of God not advancing it then it's not the spirit of God working in you I want you to let's just look briefly at verse 1 and following and see how unclean spirit is manifested in these verses let's see how the unclean spirit is manifested in the early verses so that by the time we get down to the later verse now we understand what Jesus is labeling so let's let's look at verse 1 and following verse 1 says again he entered the synagogue and there's a man who had a withered hand so somebody had a problem verse 2 they watched to see whether he would cure him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. Pause. Pause at verse 2. The first sign of an unclean spirit in this text. You know why? Watch this. Watch this. They watched to see whether he would cure the man on the Sabbath. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> Oh, Lord of mercy. Effectively, they were waiting to see Jesus mess up. Anybody with me? They were waiting to see Jesus fail. They were hoping that to heal the man on the Sabbath was wrong. And they were waiting to see if he would go wrong. Hello, are you with me? Come on, you're hearing that? In other words, the unclean spirit wants to see other people fail and fall. Oh, Lord of mercy. Talk to me, talk to me, talk to me. The unclean spirit waits and wants to see the next person fall. Come on, anybody hearing me? While the spirit of God wants to save souls. Come on, you know it. If you are not personally doing it, you know how you're waiting to see somebody fall. You want to see them mess up. You want to see them fail. That is never going to be the spirit of God at work in your life. Come on, talk to me. If it's somebody you feel did you wrong and you want to see them fall, it still is not the spirit of God because the spirit of God calls for forgiveness. Anybody hearing me? Far too many people are waiting to see somebody fall. 
What spirit do you think that is? The Holy Spirit, keep the verse up there. We're going to the next one. Is that the Holy Spirit? And sometimes we could try to help avoid people falling and embarrassing themselves. But no, we wait to see them fall. I always remember as a young man when I made the decision I was going to stop drinking. As I always say, you have to be careful who you have in your life. Mind you, it worked out in a way to motivate me. But one of my good friends at the time said, that was like November I'd made that decision. He said, I bet you by Christmas, you're gonna drink again. In fact, before Christmas. And I tell you, I'm sure what, this is at least 20 plus years ago, we bet. And to this day, praise be to God by his grace and mercy at work in my life. Are you hearing me here? But a friend ain't supposed to be waiting to see you fall. He's supposed to be there to say, boy, I will try to see how I could help and support and brace you with this. Hello, are you with me? And we have even close friends in our lives waiting to see us fall. And we are in other people's lives waiting to see them fall. We are in church waiting to see people in church fall. That is not the spirit of God. A satanic spirit. Hello, are you with me? Next verse. Watch what goes on. Then Jesus, because he knew their bad mindedness, he says to the withered man with the hand, come forward. And it's as if he gives them an opportunity by calling the man forward to now share their concern. Because look at what it says. He says, look, is it lawful for me to go do good or harm on the Sabbath to save life? But what? But what, what does it say? That's why sometimes you hear me talk about the underground movement in church and society. They had an opportunity, am I correct, to share their concern to try to make sure if there was any misunderstanding, it was cleared up. They had an opportunity in the event that Jesus was going to act wrongly to help to share their concerns so he could act rightly. Am I correct? They had an opportunity. If in fact Jesus was going to be wrong to heal on the Sabbath, here is the moment to raise their concern. But no, you notice what happened? The underground movement. They would whisper among themselves and wait to see you fail rather than try to help to keep you standing. Anybody hearing me? And anytime you see you are working and waiting to see people fail, and you may have an opportunity, you could raise a concern, share, but instead you choose to go underground to undermine, guess what spirit that is? That certainly is not the... Are you hearing me? That's not the Holy Spirit. And this is not just a church problem. This is a national problem, a global problem. That's why I say to people sometimes, the other day I was saying to somebody, they heard something and they're done ready to go undermine and pull down. I said, man, I'm sure you could find out you know somebody who could give you the proper information. But we're not interested in that. If somebody says something about mother and it's sweet and it pulled down mother, we come in church with mother and could come and say, but mother, I, I heard this. Some mother could clarify, but we remain silent. Come on, talk to me. We go underground, we post it, we share it, we spread it. What spirit is that? What spirit is that? And our nation can never build if people are just waiting for the next person to fail. And just everybody underground, underground. That's why people like social media. You don't have to face people. When the Holy Spirit is at work, we try to do what? 
build up the unclean spirit in the church, out of the church, undermines. Don't be part of no underground movement. People who come in and bring comments to you and zoo, 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 zoo. make sure ask them, you go talk to the woman. Don't take the sweetness and carry it to somebody else. Did you go talk to them? Hello, say amen, church. <laughs> Are you hearing me? So many times we could help to save somebody, build up somebody. But instead we go underground. Hey Jesus, come. If you have a problem, tell me now. That's what Jesus says. But they do, what he says there? They remain silent. The same people who later on go and say, Jesus has an. Jesus said, look, effectively, who is working to advance the kingdom of God? Me or you? Who is working to advance the kingdom of God? Me or you? Who rejects sin and evil and deception? Me or you? Who is working to build up the church and the nation? Me or you? Who is working to build people's lives up? Me or you? That's what Jesus said to them. So I ask the question again. What spirit is at work in you? There's more, but I'll stop in there. I ask the question again. What spirit is at work in you? If it is the Holy Spirit, you'll be saved. You'll be trying to grow in Christ. You'll be growing in Christ. Because the Holy Spirit will be pruning you. If it's the Holy Spirit, you will be contributing to the kingdom of God growing. You will be helping other people to know Jesus Christ. You will be demonstrating by your life the love of God in Christ. If it's the Holy Spirit. If it's the Holy Spirit, you will be changed. And people around you will be influenced by you for change for God. Is the Holy Spirit at work in you? Yes, you may have all kind of fancy gifts. You may have gifts of dreams and you may see visions. You may be able to prophesy and speak in tongues. But the gifts, talents and abilities, whether they're spiritual gifts or other gifts that we don't count as spiritual, even though they are, because they come from God. Or are you of the kind who rather than working against sin, you're working to promote sin? You're encouraging sin. You're part of the underground movement, watching to see other people fall. Come on, you know it. Are you the kind of person when mother comes home and mother tell you I was in church this morning, you know, and we were talking about the Holy Spirit. And mother said, you know, I really was reflecting on me. You bad with he? It's not me. It's the Bible. Hello, are you with me? What kind of spirit is that? That's certainly not the Holy Spirit walking there. Hello? What spirit is that working you? You could be a good person, you know, but with a bad spirit. Anybody hearing that? You could be a hard church worker, faithful worshiper, but with a bad spirit, an unclean spirit. So let's end with the song again. Brother B, create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit. And when we sing, if you want to stand, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it up to you. If this is a prayer that you feel you want to take personally and make a commitment, Lord, Make sure the right spirit is in me. Feel free to stand as we sing.
Creating me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. Creating me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit. Cast me not, cast me not away from thy presence, O Lord, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore, restore unto me the joy of your salvation. Just before we sing again, you see, this for me is the great thing. David and Jesus' ministry tells us that even when unhealthy spirit, when unclean spirit is at work in us, we can be delivered. We can, God can put a right spirit in us. Don't feel that we don't have a choice. We just have to continue where we're going. That's the wonderful thing. Jesus' whole ministry was a ministry that brought people to experience the Holy Spirit working their life, saving them, delivering them, renewing them. This idea that we feel we have to be under the power of sin and Satan, that's an unclean spirit working in your mind. That if the Spirit of God is at work, if you allow God to, He could take that bad spirit and put the right spirit in you. And let me tell you, if right now you're thinking, boy, no, I didn't think I could make that. that, that's an unclean spirit thinking there. Because when the Holy Spirit of God is at work, it reminds us that we can do all things, not on our own strength, but through Christ, who gives us the strength. So don't feel because, you know, you may realize that the way you've been living your life hasn't really advanced the kingdom of God and that there's an unclean spirit and the unclean spirits are in your life and you don't feel so bewildered that you say, well, oh, Lord of mercy, I done doomed. No, that's the good news. Jesus' whole ministry, every individual who was saved used to be allowing the unclean spirit to govern and rule their life. And as one songwriter says, there is no secret what God can do. What he has done for others, he can do for you. So we sing one more time, create in me a clean heart. Create in me a clean heart, O oh Lord, and renew a right spirit within me.
and renew and renew our right spirit within me one more time and renew and renew our right spirit within me gracious God and Heavenly Father Your presence brings healing, brings deliverance, brings victory over sin and Satan. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, when your Holy Spirit is at work in our lives, we are able to see the cross is before me and I'm moving to the cross and the world is behind me. When the Holy Spirit is at work in our lives, we reject sin and evil. When the Holy Spirit is in our lives, we love you and we love others. The kind of love captured in John 3:16 that we don't want to see others perish, but to see them have everlasting life. The kind of love that compels us to seek to enable the salvation of others. The kind of love for you, O oh God, that makes us uncomfortable with sin not excusing it, not justifying it, but rejecting it. When your Holy Spirit is at work, Paul says we grow. We move from milk to solid food. So there's a deliberate progress in our relationship with you. When your Holy Spirit is at work, we seek first your kingdom and his righteousness and everything else of importance will come after when your holy spirit is at work we say have thine own way lord have thine own way i am the potter you are the clay when the holy spirit is at work we are not content with simply working for you but we are intent on a relationship with you. When the Holy Spirit is at work, we understand the importance of saying, my Jesus, I love thee, I know thou art mine. If ever I love thee, my Jesus, is now. When the Holy Spirit is at work, people around us, are inspired, are challenged, are encouraged towards righteousness. So dear God, cast us not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from us, but restore unto each and every one of us the joy of knowing you as our personal Lord and Savior and give us the Holy Spirit, renew that right spirit in us. God, maybe for some of us, we are like David, we lost our way. And we have allowed unclean spirits to rule. So today we say, Lord, I find my way back to you. So God, I pray that your Holy Spirit will fall afresh on each person standing, first of all, as they, as they stand saying, renew a right spirit within me. I pray, oh God, your Holy Spirit will work in their lives in a very profound and powerful way. That through them, your kingdom will be advanced. Through this church, beyond this church, in this nation. 
Gracious God and Heavenly Father, I pray that your spirit will so fall on them that as a result of their lives in you and ministry for you, people experience physical, spiritual healing, deliverance. People will come to know you as their Lord and Savior. People reject the reign and rule of Satan. God, we pray that you will build a hedge around them because we are mindful that whenever the Spirit is at work seeking to capture territory, Satan doesn't just surrender it. And that's why Paul says we wrestle. And so, God, we pray that as they wrestle against the kingdom of darkness, that they will depend and trust in you for the victory. Because it still is true that Jesus is stronger than Satan and sin. Satan to Jesus must bow. Therefore, I triumph without and within. Jesus saves me now. God, for the rest of us in this church, all of us in this church, I pray that your spirit will rule in all our lives. Even those who have not stood up, O oh God, I pray that they'll be convicted by your word and by your spirit. And that even so, they too will recognize where they have lost their way or are on the wrong path and be able to say, Renew, put a right spirit in me, O oh God. God, may, may your Holy Spirit reign in this church and in all our lives. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on all of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Shall we all stand as we sing one more time? God,